Father in heaven, I want to thank you. You are an ever-present help in the time of trouble and that you never fail nor forsake us. And now as we continue this worship service, I pray for your spirit to use me to be a blessing so that when we are done today, every single person will have seen and heard Jesus. So use me in spite of me and let your spirit teach us now, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to take your Bibles, if you would, and turn to Genesis, the sixth chapter. I'm sure you all recognize the ark. Children, turn to Genesis 6. We're going to look at verses 13, 14, 15 to set the stage for the sermon. So take your Bibles, Genesis 6. That's about the ark, Noah's ark. And we will begin reading at verse number three. All right, does everybody have it? Children, you got your Bibles open? All right, here we go. And God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. And this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits. It's width 550 cubits and its height 30 cubits. Now, I want to make one point about this command to Noah and to show the contact that this story has with us today. Okay? Make an ark. By the way, how many years did Noah preach? 120. What was his purpose of preaching? So more people would get on the ark, right? Okay, here's the point. Are you ready? The ark of safety, I call it, happened to be the only safety and the only way. Okay, you got that? Have you stopped and thought because as a little kid in Sabbath school, perhaps, you heard this story about Noah. But let's stop right now and think. The ark was the only method of salvation. There was no other one. Nope, there wasn't some highfalutin cruise ship that you could choose to go on instead. There were no alternatives. It was either the ark or it was nothing. And so I'm excited to start with you this day a series of sermons entitled, Are You Building Your Ark? And I hope, by the way, the answer is yes. And if you are building your ark, there's four things that you need to consider. First of all, the spiritual foundation of your ark. Secondly, the physical body of your ark. Thirdly, the mental state of your ark. And fourthly, the social practice of your ark. For remember the premise here, there is no other way of salvation than through the ark. So let's begin today with part number one, and that is the spiritual foundation of your ark. For when Noah began to build, he first set out a skeleton, and he built from that skeleton. If it was your home we're talking about, there would be a foundation first to build upon. 
And so if you're an ark builder, and this is the day and age for ark building, right? As in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man, the spiritual foundation of your ark. Take your Bibles if you would, and now let's go to John, the third chapter. Folks, I'm going to take one of the most exciting portions of Scripture and not do it justice because I have a, a direction I'm going here. You know, the third chapter of John in the Desire of Ages, we're told, is the most complete explanation for the plan of salvation of any chapter in the book. Isn't that amazing? And so we're going to look just at a portion of it to set the stage. If you're art building, we need to know the spiritual foundation of your ark. So here we are in John, the third chapter. We're going to first read verse 1 through 5, then 9, and then 14. Okay? All right, here we go. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. He was a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night, and he said to him, <coughs> Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no man could do the things that you do unless God be with him. And Jesus answered and said to Nicodemus, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. And Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born again when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, let me pause right there just for a brief moment. For first, I want to elevate Nicodemus in your eyes to probably the most prestigious of all the Sanhedrin members outside of the high priest himself. This man was respected, he was admired, he was faithful, he was generous, he was thoughtful, he was always there for God's people and church. And Jesus looked at him and said, Nicodemus, you are not good enough. That's what he said. You're not good enough. He said in Nicodemus, unless you are born again, you can not only not see, but you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. And if you're stumbling over this born again idea, I added the words from above. In other words, your first birth produced another earthly person. The second birth, if it takes place, produces a spiritual person. You must be born again. It doesn't matter what your accomplishments are. It doesn't matter what your education is. It doesn't matter your bloodline. None of that counts unless you're born again. Look at this quote from the Desire of Ages. Puts it all in perspective. Nicodemus had come to the Lord thinking to enter into a discussion with him, but Jesus said, but Jesus laid bare the what? The foundation principles of truth. By the way, you see how important this chapter is? It's incredible. And I'm not doing it justice. 
But we are working towards an end here that's very important. And so Jesus gave the foundation principles of truth by starting out, unless you are born again. Now let me ask you a question. Are you born again? Have you literally fallen on the floor in front of whatever, your sofa, your bed, and, and begged the Lord to enter your life and admitted that you're a sinner? And invited the Holy Spirit to come and live in your heart. If you haven't done that in some fashion or form, it is possible you are not born again. And that is one of the foundation principles of truth. I don't care how long you've been an Adventist. I don't know, care how many generations. I don't care how meticulously you follow all the instructions. And brothers and sisters, today we're getting really weak in that area. What matters is being born again. That's when the Spirit takes over your mind, takes over your heart, takes over your mouth, takes over your hands, takes over your ears. And folks, it is a struggle. I have it myself. But I must be born again. And Nicodemus came to show respect for this young arp start that showed up from nowhere. He came at night because he didn't want any of the other Sanhedrin to see him, but there happened to be a little bit of embarrassment in there too. And he wanted to enter into a discussion, and Jesus got to the heart of the matter because he loved this man to death. And so instead of getting involved in a conversation, he said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Now I want you to notice verse 14, or verse 9, excuse me. In fact, let me work up to verse 9. If you read this carefully, it's amazing because at first Nicodemus, being who he was, was very offended by what Jesus said to him. Be, me be born again? That, that's what we talk about the, the heathens when they come into the Jewish religion. They're born again. I was born in this church. Remember what they said? Remember? Uh, I'm the son of Abraham. We've got it made. We got it down pat. We got the truth. We got it nailed. How dare you say that to me? He's working through all these emotions, but the way Jesus said it, the look in his eyes just melted him. Melted him. And suddenly, out of desperation, he finally says in verse 9, what did he literally say in verse 9? How can this be? This is the most crucial question in all of Scripture. Okay, at first I was very offended and angry because of my position, but I listened to you speak about the Spirit, about being born again. I looked in your eyes and I saw your love and patience. Please explain it to me. I want it. And so... Nicodemus asked that fateful question, and we are desperate for the answer. How can this be? And now for the spiritual foundation of your ark, folks. I'm going to answer this question, and I apologize in advance that it is so simple. Especially if you're a complex person that likes challenges. There is nothing complicated about the answer to his question. Except overcoming your pride and practicing what he suggested to Nicodemus in order to be born again. Okay? Let's look at verse 14. Finally, he gets down to it, and Jesus says, what? Read it. And 
as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. There is the answer. But you see, you might get a little puzzled at his answer unless you go back to Numbers 21 and read the story that he was referring to. Yes, Jesus was teaching Nicodemus the answer to the question from the Old Testament. So take your Bible and go to Numbers 21. Let's see what in the world happened in this story that you're probably very familiar with. Maybe you missed this before, but Jesus said this is the answer. How can this be? How can it happen to me? Take a look at the serpent in the wilderness that Moses lifted up. Okay, do you have Numbers 21? Look at verse 4. There's just a couple verses. It's amazing. Here it is. Then they traveled from the Mount Or by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, and the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. Okay, so they're just about to the promised land, folks. And, and if you read this carefully, they were just attacked by Arkad, the king of Arkad, and the Canaanites had attacked them, and that discouraged them, although they defeated them. And they were sick and tired of the manna and all the other stuff, and they were griping and complaining, and because of that, they had to go a longer way around because they hesitated and didn't listen, and something happened to them. And then they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, and the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food, no water, and our souls loathe this worthless bread. Whoa. This is open rebellion, folks. So the Lord sent fiery serpents. How many of you like snakes? How many of you like fiery snakes? That's poisonous, right? I know that six years we've been climbing the mountain on Wednesday morning to pray over the valley. Two different times we saw a rattlesnake. One time, David Clemente was with me, and he said, do you hear that? And I'll tell you, I didn't hear it. He goes, look, there's a rattlesnake on the side of our path going up to the mountain. The last time was with uh, Pastor Julio and Charisma, and believe me, they do not want to see another fiery serpent. By the way, I got a picture of that on my phone. It wasn't a very big one, but it was a rattlesnake. And so the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people. And many of the people of Israel died. Now, before you have a heart attack here about the Lord and his justice and, and his mercy, and how do we blend the two, what this means is when they openly rebel, God says, okay, let me show you what happens when I remove my protection that kept you safe from things you didn't even know existed, right? God didn't send those snakes. They were there. God just said, okay, watch this. You don't want me around? Watch this. And into the camp they came. Check out verse 7. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned. We have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Now Moses is an amazing person. I don't think I'd have prayed for him after they ripped me to shreds. You know, you know I, how about you deserved it? 
No, he prayed. And then God did something very incredible. Then the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. And so Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. And so it was, if the serpent had bitten anyone, then he looked at the bronze serpent, and he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. Now, folks, what is the point of this story? What is the crux of this story? What is the high point of this story? When they looked at the bronze serpent, they lived. Now let's stop and think just for a second so you can see the incredible deep theology here as well as the simple answer to his question. And that is, who did the bronze snake represent? I heard some mumbling, but you know, the serpent represents Satan. Satan is sin, and sin is what kills. But why put the sin on a stake and tell the people to look at it? Because the Bible teaches that he who knew no sin became sin for us. That bronze serpent represents Jesus on the cross of Calvary, not for his sins, but for my sins. And we are told that whoever looks at that will live. I want to clarify something here to make sure that we understand this carefully because I've had a little different experience being raised in the Catholic Church. John Fisher, in his book, On the Hill Too Far Away, tells of a church in Old Greenwich, Connecticut, and there is a one-of-a-kind cross in that church. It's not that the cross is overtly unique. What's really strange is that the cross is positioned, is where the cross is positioned in the sanctuary. This cross isn't behind or above the altar. The cross in this church is bolted down into the concrete floor right in the middle of the aisle. It's, be, it's between the pews and the altar. It's an obstruction. The pastor's words have to pass through it, and the congregation's eyes always have to be somewhere in view. In other words, you see it all the time, sitting right there. But I have a problem with that, folks. For in the Catholic Church, you'll find many crosses. You see, it isn't the cross. Then what is it? It's the person on the cross. When you behold Jesus, you are born again. When you behold Jesus through prayer, Bible study, and the reading of the spirit of prophecy, the Holy Spirit comes and changes your heart. And yes, you may go out five minutes later in sin, but because of that experience, you immediately repent, say you're sorry, and you start over even though you've done it a thousand times. It is the person on the cross 
not the instrument of the cross. And of course, sooner or later, you see the cross because that demonstrates if he paid that price, he'll pay any price. But it's the person. So here's the question. If you're building an ark, the spiritual foundation of your ark is you must know personally and intimately know Jesus Christ that died and just that he, not just that he died, but that he died. I didn't say that right. I got to redeem this whole thing. I'm sorry, Lord, I must have worded it wrong. Folks, do you know Jesus personally and intimately? See, everywhere you go in the church I used to belong to, I could see a cross everywhere. But what about the person on the cross? Do you have a personal relationship? I was never told to have a personal relationship. We can lay the cross right here. You can stumble on it when you come up to pray. But unless you have a personal, intimate relationship with a man on the cross, your ark does not have a spiritual foundation. And so the very basis of building an ark has to be that Jesus is your personal friend. And remember, we have three other aspects in the next three weeks to take a look at. But let me just fortify this thought. So everybody turn to John 17. Let's test this out. So we go to John 17 to see if there's any truth into what I'm saying here because it is so simple. All you have to do is spend time every day with Jesus and he does the work of changing your heart. Is that true? In Jesus' prayer, in chapter 17 of John, look what he says in verse 3. He says, and this is life eternal. Okay, stop. I'm listening. This is life eternal. The next utterance is going to tell us what life eternal is. You, you agree with me? Okay. Jesus says that they may know you, the only true God, and know me whom you sent. That is life eternal. See, if we stopped right there, you'd be fine. The problem is you're still alive, so there's three other aspects of you that you need to include in your ark that you're building because your ark is the only way that you are going to make it to safety. And the spiritual foundation is number one, and that is a personal, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. It is not the instrument, it's the person on the instrument. And have you noticed 2 Corinthians 3.18? We got to go. You know, we go to Jesus. He's, the, he, he's our authority, but also in the, in, the old, in the New Testament, the preeminent biblical scholar and theologian is Paul. And look what he says in 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18, the last verse in chapter 3.18. He says, but we with unveiled face now, Unveil face, here it is. If you read before this and go back to Genesis, who had to veil his face? Who had to veil his face? Moses. Moses. Why? Because he had spent time with God and came down glowing so bright that they said, cover your face, we can't look at you. See, by the way, did you hear that? Did you hear that? He had been with God, therefore his face was shining so brightly. So we with unveiled face is a reference to those who have accepted Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior and have asked for the Holy Spirit. It's unveiled your face so that you can now see spiritually. But we all with unveiled face, beholding, looking at, pondering, contemplating, 
thinking about as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. Who's the glory of the Lord? Who's the glory of the Lord? Jesus is the glory of the Lord. When we behold Jesus, it says we're being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. As by the Spirit of the Lord. There it is. All in a nutshell. So the simple answer that Nicodemus got to his very puzzling question, how can I be born again? He said, you need to spend time getting to know me. Are you doing that? I want to make a suggestion to you as I close right now. Here's one of the neatest things I was told. I want you to behold these six books. The one in the upper left-hand corner you may not even be familiar with, possibly confrontation. The one in the middle you know, desire of ages. The one next to it, steps to Christ. Then below confrontation is Christ object lessons. And then underneath steps to Christ is mount of blessings. And underneath the desire of ages is a great controversy. So here's the challenge I'd like to make. See, that was a warning to listen to me. <laughs> You're now going to receive important information crucial to your life safety. And that is, I was told by a preacher who did a week of prayer at an academy, the first tapes, tapes I ever listened to after becoming a Seventh-day Adventist, he said, take the book Desire of Ages, go to chapter 1, Look at the bottom of the book and it'll tell you where in the Bible that story is on. Say a prayer, read your Bible, then read the chapter. And do it until you finish the book, Desire of Ages. And then you take the book, Mount of Blessings, for example. And by the way, that's over the Beatitudes. And the Beatitudes are only three chapters. So every time you get up in the morning, you say a prayer, you read the three chapters, then you read one chapter in the book of Mount of Blessings till you finish it. And then when you're done with that, you go to Christ Object Lessons. You get up, you say a prayer, you look in Christ Object Lessons, where is this chapter on? You read it in your Bible, then you read one chapter until you finish the book, right? um, Christ Object Lesson. By the way, the little book, Confrontation, is amazing. It's about Jesus' battle in the wilderness with Satan, the three temptations. Every morning you get up and you read the temptations of Christ. You say a prayer, read the temptations of Christ, then read one chapter in the book, Confrontation. Now, when you get the steps to Christ, it's different because at the bottom of the page or the beginning of the chapter doesn't tell you what it's about in the book. It follows a logical procession on how you can be born again. So you say a prayer, pick out one or two chapters in your Bible and read them, and then read the chapter in Steps of Christ until you're done. Folks, you will be so full of Jesus. You'll even be amazed at how you're starting to love and feel different towards people. And then when you've done that, you're ready for great controversy. And you know what you can do when you're done? Do it all over again. For the spiritual foundation of your ark, if you're building one, is a personal, intimate relationship with Jesus. Our ark will arrive at safety. Father, I want to thank you for the challenge of the hour. We anticipate the next three sermons. May you bless each person here, Lord. Don't let anybody feel guilty if they haven't been doing something consistent. That isn't the point of the sermon. 
When I read that as a brand new Adventist, or I heard it on tapes, I realized I was just messing around with devotions. And this gave me a focus. It, it was just incredible what happened to my life as I followed this simple little formula. Oh, Lord, may we take the challenge. And may we be so full full of you, Lord, that we will be full of the love of God as you were. So bless each person who's here. Don't let them be discouraged, for you are a God of new births at any time of life. And we thank you for this. And again, just be with David now in the hospital, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.